Good afternoon, uh, everyone, or good morning, depending on from which time zone you uh, join us uh, this uh, afternoon in Oslo. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome you to this seminar about what Putin says about gender equality. My name is uh, Helge Böckesru, and it's uh, my great pleasure to, to chair uh, this uh, seminar this afternoon. Uh, it's a great pleasure because it is an interesting topic and it is the first in a series of seminars that we are going to uh, hold uh, once per semester over the next uh, three years actually. And they're all related to a new Research Council funded project that we have got, uh, values-based legitimation in authoritarian states, top-down versus bottom-up strategies, uh, the case of Russia or in short, uh, Legitrus. This is a project led by Professor Paul Kolster at the University of Oslo. And you will see uh, a link to uh, the project's uh, website uh, in, uh, in the chat if you want to learn more about what we are uh, going to focus on in the project. Uh, but in short, we will look at how uh, the Russian regime uh, attempts to legitimize its rule by a turn to conservatism and traditional values, as well as how this is received in the population at large. Um, to capture the la latter, we have uh, been carrying out uh, some large scale surveys in, in Russia and we got the results in uh, earlier this week. and. Uh, we will soon be able to, to give the first reports on uh, the results from, from these surveys. But today we'll focus on the top-down processes rather than the bottom-up. Uh, and how and to what extent uh, this mobilization of traditional values is reflected in uh, how Putin uh, addresses uh, gender issues. And to help us with that, uh, we have got Professor Valerie Sperling, a member of the Legitrus team and a professor of political science at Clark University in the US, and probably known to many of you as the author of the award-winning uh, monograph, Sex, Politics and Putin, Political Legitimacy in Russia, that was published with uh, Oxford University Press back in 2015. And uh, Valerie will uh, start by giving a presentation. Uh, she will go on for about 35, 40 minutes. And, and then we will uh, have the rest of the time to uh, Q&A. And uh, you know the drill uh, mm -hmm. from the last uh, uh, year and a half. Please uh, post your uh, questions uh, in the chat and then we will uh, try to collect questions and, and, and structure the, the, um, the discussion afterwards. And for those of you who joined us for the, the Belarus seminar uh, the other week, I, I should apologize now. Uh, for some uh, reason, we had some technical hiccups and I was not able to see the, uh, see the chat, but uh, today everything works. So please, uh, uh, as soon as uh, you realize that you have a question, uh, send it to us and, and we will uh, collect them. Uh, and uh, uh, a final bit of information from me, um, as you will see from the, your screen, this uh, event is being recorded. And if you want to revisit it later on, it will be uh, published uh, on NUPI's YouTube channel in, in due course. But uh, as for now, uh, uh, I'll leave it at that. And uh, we'd like to give the floor, or rather the screen, to, to Valerie and her uh, presentation. Please, Valerie. Thank you very much. Um, first, I'd like to thank you and the other organizers for making this event possible and providing this venue in which to share my and my colleagues' work. The study that I'm presenting today is a co-authored effort by me, and three other scholars who study Russia and gender in various ways. Uh, they are Janet Johnson, Lisa McIntosh Sundstrom, and Alexandra Novitskaya. So today I'm going to be talking about our research on Putin's speeches and what he says with regard to gender. I hope you can see the slide that says project overview. 
great. Um, we chose to look at this subject for two reasons. The first is because we're interested in gender and we want to know what Putin has said with regard to gender equality in his regular annual remarks to the public and whether the kinds of things that he says about women and gender have changed over time. The common understanding of Putin and gender equality is that his regime has become considerably more conservative over time, uh, that especially after the popular protests following the December 2011 Duma elections, that he's taken a conservative turn and embraced a traditionalist perspective with regard to women and gender issues. We can see evidence of that gender traditionalist turn in the government's policies, such as restricting abortion starting in 2011, um, the partial decriminalization of domestic battery in 2017, and the prosecution of feminist activists under the foreign agent laws. So we wanted to know if that conservative turn was also evident in what Putin says when he speaks to the public. The second reason we decided to look at Putin's speeches and what he says with regard to gender is because we think that this analysis can help scholars better understand how Putin rules, how he and his government stay in power and legitimate their rule. While the popular understanding of Putin's government outside of Russia may be that he's extremely powerful and he rules Russia more or less as a dictator, political scientists who study Russia are increasingly making a more subtle argument namely that while Putin is extremely powerful, um, especially as the president vis-a-vis -vis the other branches of the Russian government, he's not all powerful. Um, and that indeed, in order to remain in power, he has to use a mixture of tactics and take a variety of ideological positions in order to balance a lot of different constituencies that have different values and different interests. Um, there are different interests among Russia's elites, to whom uh, Putin needs to appeal, and also different interests within the general public. So looking at what Putin says about gender in his speeches gives us a lens on this legitimation process. If he talks about women in a very conservative or traditionalist way, he may be signaling his support for conservative elites and members of the general public and seeking their support. And when he talks about women in a more liberal egalitarian way, then he's signaling his support for a different constituency and wanting their support in return as well. So in this project, we systematically analyzed two decades of Putin's annual speeches to see what he said about gender and gender equality. From the end of 1999, when he became acting president, up until March of 2020, when the pandemic began. We looked at five of his annual speaking events that are largely aimed at a general domestic you know, Russian audience. These are his annual speech to the Federal Assembly, his New Year's Eve speech, his International Women's Day speech, and his remarks at the annual big press conference and direct line call-in show. We took everything he said in these venues and coded his remarks on an ideological spectrum that runs from explicitly promoting gender equality, almost like a liberal feminist um, perspective, to remarks opposing gender equality, taking a very conservative perspective, you know, that women should not work outside the home, that abortion should not be legal, that the state should never intervene in the family, and so on. So we used five coding categories along this spectrum, which I'm going to briefly describe now. And if you want, we can talk more about how we came up with them uh, during the Q&A. So the first category is what we're calling promoting gender equality. To define this, we drew on feminist political science, um, and specifically from a piece by Mala Toon and Laurel Weldon, that describes gender equality as a situation in which women and men have similar opportunities to participate in politics, the economy, and society. Their roles are equally valued. Neither suffers from gender-based disadvantage and both are considered free and autonomous human beings with dignity and rights. The ideological category based on these principles is prescriptive. In other words, it includes a should. Um, it argues that differences between men and women are socially constructed, that they are gender differences, not biologically based, um, and that existing biological differences should not constrain a person's roles, behaviors, and choices or opportunities. 
So pro-gender equality statements and policies try to move society closer to equality of opportunity. They encourage women to be actively engaged in the public sphere of work and paid work, politics, uh, culture, and they encourage men to increase their involvement in household labor and child rearing. Now for each gender ideological coding category, we thought about who the constituency might be in the Russian context. So Putin's constituencies for statements that promote gender equality would be younger and more progressively minded people, the urban creative class in Russia's big cities, and a small handful of pro-feminist state officials and legislators. Now at the opposite end of the spectrum are two categories that capture remarks that embrace what is often talked about as traditional values. Especially after 2012, Russia under Putin has been commonly described as embracing or attempting to restore traditional values, especially with regard to the family. In this traditional gender category um, or, or ideology, the family is assumed to be heterosexual and it entails a quote unquote natural uh, division of labor based on essentialist biologically driven sex roles, not on equally shared family responsibilities. People who support these traditional values prefer to address Russia's so-called demographic problem by increasing the birth rate, especially among ethnic Russians, and they tend to oppose abortion and divorce as being anti-family. For our coding purposes, we divided this traditional values territory into two ideological categories with two different constituencies. The category at the far opposite end of the spectrum from promoting gender equality is what we call the anti-gender and ultra conservative category. Now this is the more extreme category of the two traditional values categories on our spectrum. It's nationalist, it's explicitly religious, and this position became more visible in Russia after Patriarch Kirill was appointed as head of the Russian Orthodox Church in 2009, and a handful of Russian Orthodox parent groups emerged in the mid-2000s. People who endorse this perspective believe that the heterosexual family with multiple children is in crisis, and they strictly oppose abortion, they assert the need for traditional family values as opposed to what they see like as Western values being imposed on Russia, especially with regard to uh, gender and sexuality. Like the gender equality category, this category is prescriptive. It is about what women should or should not do. Supporters of this position believe women should not work for pay. Uh, they should leave the breadwinning to men. They generally do not support payments to women for staying home to take care of children, like the maternity capital program, and they prefer more significant long-term support for large families. They also want the state to stay out of the private sphere of the heterosexual family. So they supported the decriminalization of some forms of domestic battery in 2017. We label their ideology both ultra-conservative and anti-gender, because of their opposition to what they call gender ideology. They explicitly reject the feminist idea that sex roles are socially constructed and therefore are gender roles. Putin's constituency for remarks endorsing beliefs in this category would include the leadership of the Russian Orthodox Church and a handful of highly placed Russian elites um, like the billionaire banker Konstantin Malakayev, as well as a small number of academics and Duma deputies and paramilitary organizations. We labeled the second less extreme coding category associated with traditional values as traditionalist. This is also a prescriptive category. Its supporters favor traditional heterosexual families and believe that women should have more children. As a way to increase the population, they want to limit abortion and convince families to have more than one child by using Russia's maternity capital program without endorsing a strict ban on abortion or questioning whether women should work outside the home. Constituents for this position include some of the Russian Orthodox Church leadership, moderate religious believers, and parts of the population whose beliefs are somewhat conservative and increasingly anti-Western, especially after the annexation of Crimea in 2014 and the sanctions imposed on Russia after the invasion of Ukraine. 
In the middle of our spectrum is a category that we call stereotypical Soviet that reflects the legacy of the Soviet conception of gender. Um, by the late Soviet period, as Yelena Zdravomislava and Anna Tyomkina have described, the Soviet conception of gender regarded hierarchies based on sex as unfair, while also arguing that the characteristics of maleness and femaleness were very much linked to biology. So the Soviet perspective, like the more traditionalist ones on our spectrum, is gender essentialist and binary about men's and women's characteristics and abilities, especially with regard to taking care of children, which is seen as typically but not exclusively women's responsibility. However, there is another part of the Soviet conception of gender, which is a somewhat egalitarian view that women are fully capable of being in the public sphere and working outside the home, except in jobs that are seen as too physically demanding or dangerous to their reproductive health, um, or that would interfere with their duties as mothers. In the Soviet conception, motherhood was the most important of women's roles, um, while fatherhood was not seen as the most important of, uh, of men's roles. And the state's responsibility was to enable women to combine paid work outside the home with their other with their child rearing responsibilities. We call this category stereotypical Soviet to emphasize the typical binary gender stereotypes that it relies on, like the idea that women are more sensitive and less aggressive than men, and that they bring these qualities into the workplace or wherever else women participate in public life. In terms of the constituencies for statements supporting these ideas, we include people who were raised under Soviet rule um, and the so-called blue collar majority who expect somewhat Soviet style state provided benefits and who tend to be more socially conservative than the urban middle class. Public opinion polls suggest that a majority of the population fits into this middle ground, holding a mix of sort of stereotypical sexist views and egalitarian views. It's also important to point out for our coding scheme that this Soviet stereotypical category is not prescriptive like the others I've described so far. It's descriptive, claiming that women and men are shaped by their physiologies, not that their roles should be traditional and based on essential physical qualities, or that society should be restructured in the direction of equal opportunities uh, for women and men. So those are the four overtly gendered coding categories that we applied to Putin's speeches. But there's one additional category that we called neutral to capture situations in which a gender neutral term is used to describe something that is typically gendered male or female in the Russian context. So this would, would include referring to people in the military instead of men in the military and to people or families with children instead of women with children. Um, when talking about a government program like Russia's maternity capital program that provides financial incentives to women for childbearing. So the constituents for this neutral category are probably close to those who would respond well to the gender equality statements um, like democracy and human rights advocates, scholars who might not be explicitly pro-feminist but who are oriented toward legal equality. Okay, so now I want to tell you what we found in general terms with regard to the coding of the speeches, and then I'll talk about our findings in more detail. What we found was that in these speeches, Putin's remarks on gender ranged from being pro-gender equality in some cases uh, to being somewhat traditionalist in others. But interestingly, that he says nothing that we would characterize as fitting into the far right anti-gender ultra conservative category. To elaborate on our findings a little further, we found that while the frequency of Putin's statements that embrace gender equality declined over the course of his rule, there was not an accompanying shift toward an explicit far right conservatism. Instead, what we see is a clear expansion of that gender stereotypical Soviet view that had dominated Putin's statements on gender related issues for as long as he has been in power. Now, given Russia's gender conservative turn in state policy, especially after 2011, it seems rather puzzling that in these speeches, Putin seems to stay away from making arch conservative statements about gender roles or gender related policies, especially if you adopt the view of Putin as an extremely powerful strongman ruler. Why would 
an autocrat failed to use his powerful position to repeatedly endorse the gender conservative policies that his regime has chosen to adopt. Uh, moreover, Putin is often painted as a decisive, even uncompromising politician who does not tolerate opposition. So why doesn't he use these speeches as an opportunity to endorse the ultra conservative views that are believed to be increasingly influential in his regime? Looking at our findings, we argue that Putin's diverse remarks across the spectrum of gender equality and inequality represent an important part of his legitimation strategy, his ongoing effort to balance diverse elite interests and to gain or retain popular support. We don't assume that we can know what Putin believes based on what he says. Instead, we're suggesting that when he speaks, he's selectively responding to various constituencies that have a variety of positions on gender issues. So in the, in the remainder of my talk today, I'm gonna to say a little more about our data and methods and then talk about our findings, which gender categories show up in these speeches, how does that change over time, which gender issues or topics are raised or not raised, and what does it all mean uh, with regard to Putin's legitimation strategy and how he governs. So uh, Putin gave these speeches almost every year throughout his presidencies, uh, but during the Medvedev presidency, the only one he continued to do was the direct line call-in show. So we analyzed 80 speeches in total, uh, the Federal Assembly speeches are the most formal, while the New Year's and Women's Day speeches are shorter um, and, and more celebratory. And the direct line and big press conference obviously are interactive. We focused on these speeches because they're aimed at a broad audience, capturing all of Putin's domestic constituencies, and because they enabled us to make consistent comparisons over time. To systematically analyze the content of the speeches, we used InVivo, which is a software program for qualitative data analysis. We first identified 55 potentially gender-related Russian language search terms like woman, man, family, child, maternity, uh, equal, as in equal pay, abortion, violence, in case there was a reference to domestic violence. We put the transcripts of the speeches into in vivo and searched them using these terms um, as a way to bring up everything that Putin had said related to gender. And again, I can say more about the method in the Q&A if people are interested. And then using our five gender ideology categories that I just described, we coded all of the fragments of Putin's speech that we had found by searching the transcripts for those gender related terms. And what did we find? Probably the most conspicuous finding um, of our analysis is that with the exception of the International Women's Day speeches, where he spent more time talking about women, President Putin does not say very much on gender related issues. Only 5% of the entire text of these speeches refers to issues or people in any kind of a gendered way. In fact, over all of the years of speeches that we examined, Putin used the term gender exactly once. Um, that was during the 2019 big press conference in answer to a question about whether he could imagine a woman being president of Russia. Putin's answer was positive and we coded part of his answer as promoting gender equality because he said, and I quote, from the perspective of the ability to govern, the requirements cannot differ on some kind of gender principles. These requirements are identical, competence, decency, and so on. But we also coded part of his answer as Soviet stereotypical, where he said, uh, but a woman nevertheless brings to politics a certain female essence, less aggression, it seems to me. That will certainly be in demand. Um, but even though he used the word gender only once, it does not mean that he ignored gender issues in these speeches. So we coded 342 of Putin's statements as being gender related over the entire time period of all the speeches. We categorized almost two thirds of these statements as stereotypical Soviet and relatively few, just over 6% um, as traditionalist or anti-gender ultra conservative. A more significant percentage of his remarks fell in the promoting gender equality category, about 15%, and we characterized 17% as neutral. In terms of change over time, our analysis shows that the number of Putin's stereotypical Soviet statements increased over time at the expense of statements promoting gender equality. Now this shift can be clearly seen um, oops, by, um, by dividing the Putin era into two time periods. 
So his first two terms as president from 2000 to 2008, and his second two terms from 2012 onward. So if you keep your eye on the stereotypical Soviet uh, and the gender equality sectors of the, um, of the pie chart, you can see that the stereotypical Soviet remarks increase as a proportion of his gender relevant statements, but his pro-gender equality remarks decreased over time. The volume of Putin's gendered speech increased over time as well, with more gender relevant statements between 2012 and 2020 uh, than had been before. I want to point out that the introduction of the maternity capital program in 2007 accounts for a lot of the increase in the volume of gender relevant remarks um, and the increased number of statements in the Soviet stereotypical category. I also want to note here that coding Putin's remarks about the maternity capital policy was somewhat complicated. And again, I'll be happy to talk about that, how we chose to code it in the Q&A. Now, looking more closely at the change over time, Putin's International Women's Day speeches show the strongest evidence of the decline over time in statements promoting gender equality and their replacement with more stereotypical Soviet remarks. For example, in the year 2000, in his International Women's Day speech, Putin noted that despite the fact that women plow no worse than men, they sometimes get less for their work, unfortunately. In 2001, he complained about the rarity of women in high governmental positions. Putin also described raising children in an egalitarian way, um, saying in 2002 that he would not want people to get the impression that only women should take care of children. That would be wrong in general. And he noted in 2004, that men understand how important men's and women's participation is in all spheres, whether it's the work or the family. Only then can harmony in society and the state be attained. Um, over time, however, there was a shift in Putin's tone in the March 8th speeches toward a more stereotypical Soviet and even traditionalist perspective when praising mothers. So for example, in uh, 2015, as he read his March 8th reading, uh, to a group of mothers of accomplished uh, Russian artists and athletes and, uh, and uh, scientists, Putin openly asserted his focus on the celebration of motherhood, saying, it is no coincidence that today we invited to the Kremlin women who have given our country children who in turn glorify and strengthen our state, culture, education, science, sports, and the arts. And he added, according to a Russian saying, the most sacred thing is a mother. Perhaps most surprisingly, given his reputation as a gender traditionalist, Putin made extremely few ultra conservative anti-gender statements in the speeches we analyzed. There were only three such comments in two decades, and they were all in response to questions at the direct line or big press conference. And none of them was about women or gender roles. Two were about homosexuality, and one was a remark criticizing uh, juvenile justice, specifically the so-called spanking law, that temporarily in 2016 made violence within the family a criminal act. Um, and this was a law that the Orthodox Church for, firmly opposed. While Putin has stayed away from an ultra conservative, from ultra conservative gendered statements in these speeches, he has made somewhat more frequent gestures to traditionalists on gender related issues. One unusually specific signal in the traditional category was a remark he made at the big press conference in 2013 that Pussy Riot had, quote, dishonored women in order to stand out and promote themselves in some way. They crossed every line. Such remarks illustrate Putin's selective responsiveness to his more right wing constituencies. Instead of explicitly endorsing their position, he signals his support to gender traditionalists without committing to a specific or a concrete um, policy. Now, most of Putin's traditionalist statements, about half of the total of 19 traditionalist statements that he made, had to do with maternity, and most of the others were non-specific mentions of family values. The statements related to maternity were mostly subtle applications of the prescriptive quality of the traditional category, and they came up only at his interactive events. These remarks typically occurred when the women in the audience at the direct line or the big press conference would identify themselves as being mothers. Uh, Putin would then ask how many children they had or, or they would volunteer that information when they asked their question. 
And he would then congratulate them, reinforcing the prescriptive traditionalist idea that women should have multiple children. Occasionally, Putin raised the maternity question himself when chatting with a journalist or a caller. For example, at the big press conference in 2013, a journalist asking a question volunteered the information that she had gotten married recently. So Putin congratulated her on her marriage and asked whether she had children yet. Um, he jokingly inquired whether she had any questions about the maternity capital policy. And he told her, don't delay, a positive agnosia. And then he wished her good luck. The next journalist to be called upon announced that she already had a large quantity of children. Putin interrupted to ask how many. Uh, she responded three, and he praised her, saying, you know, maladets, like, good job. These informal interactions reinforce the traditionalist notion that women ought to have multiple children, but they are not firm directives or disquisitions on women's responsibility to raise the birth rate and solve the so-called demographic problem. We can see um, also that certain topics trend in Putin's speeches. The demographic concern was the gender related issue most commonly raised at the events that we analyzed. After introducing the maternity capital policy um, in his speech to the Federal Assembly in 2006, which was one of the very few gender related issues that Putin raised in that set of speeches. Um, after that, Putin regularly referred to the maternity capital or responded to questions on it in his annual remarks at the Federal Assembly, the big press conference and the direct line. Although population growth was a, was a common theme in Putin's speeches, the way that he talked about that subject varied. In his 2012 Federal Assembly speech, for instance, he spoke about the maternity capital policy in a way that promoted gender equality. He said, our women themselves know when and what they need to do with regard to choosing when or whether to have more children. And he also said it was important that having more children not cut off women's quote, path to a career, to a good job, or force them to restrict themselves exclusively to household chores. In 2013, however, when talking about demography and the family, Putin's language shifted significantly, and he referred to quote, our position on the protection of traditional values, including the values of a traditional family, a genuine human life, including religious life, an idea that he repeated in the Federal Assembly speech in 2014, when he called for a healthy family and a healthy nation, traditional values passed on to us by our ancestors. In contrast to Putin's frequent mentions of the maternity capital program, some gender issues were only rarely raised in these speeches, if at all. Putin made only one mention of the absence of equal pay in his March 8th speech in the year 2000, when he lamented that women were unfortunately undercompensated for their work relative to men. And he never mentioned one major long-standing labor discrimination issue that is faced by women in Russia, namely the long list of jobs that are banned to women by law. Putin did not raise this issue or take any questions about it, even when that list was greatly reduced from over 400 banned jobs to around 100 such jobs by an order from the Ministry of Labor and Social Protection in October 2019. The extent to which Putin expressed a commitment to gender equality also varied depending on the issue that was raised. While he took usually a progressive gender equality stance on work-related issues, he sounded somewhat less progressive on the subjects of abortion and domestic violence. Still, even on these more controversial issues, Putin was careful not to pin himself down to an explicitly ultra conservative or even traditionalist position. He made one comment on abortion. This was at the big press conference in 2017 when he was asked whether the government would help an organization that was trying to prevent abortions by providing funds uh, to pregnant women. And Putin explained, quote, in the modern world, in the overwhelming majority of countries, that decision is left to the woman herself. Um, he said, because outlawing abortion results in illegal abortions and colossal damage to women's health and ability to have children in the future, mortality rises and so forth. In that part of his response, Putin offered a bit of pro-gender equality, uh, but then relied largely on the Soviet stereotypical framing, linking the issue back to the demographic question. Um, and then he moved on to describe the state benefits that are associated with the birth of children, including the maternity capital policy. 
Putin made only one comment on uh, domestic violence, which was at the big press conference in 2019. There he called on a journalist who had a domestic violence sign and asked whether she had a question about the draft legislation that was then under consideration to address domestic violence. The journalist pointed out that the law was opposed by the Russian Orthodox Church and by multi-child families, and that the people in favor of the law included LGBT organizations, feminist groups, and even a union of sex workers, and the journalist suggested to Putin that this law could effectively destroy efforts to increase the population by enabling total control of the state over the family. So that all came from the journalist. Putin responded that he had not read the law, but that he had been briefed on it, and that his response to it was mixed, but that he was, quote, absolutely opposed to any violence, including in the family, and of course, first off against women and children. He added that using brute physical force to get one's way was a sign of low culture and that there was nothing good about that. Further, he wondered aloud whether the law was necessary and concluded by saying he thought it should be discussed calmly, noting, we have to understand what's written in each of its articles, try to discern the results that could come from adopting the law and then make a final decision. So the journalist had taken a clearly anti-gender ultra conservative stance you know, objecting to state intervention in the family and implying that any law that was supported by LGBT people and feminists must be bad, um, Putin did not respond in that same way. He took a much more moderate stance. So to sum things up, um, while gender policy under Putin shows a shift over time toward more gender conservatism with clear changes from the first two terms of Putin's presidency to his second two terms in office, when we, were, when we examine Putin's gendered rhetoric, what he says to the broad public, we observed neither a traditionalist nor an ultra conservative turn. These findings support the political science scholarship on regime dynamics that argues that Putin is often engaged in balancing different constituencies. In these speeches, we found evidence over the course of his two decades in power that Putin's statements on gender constitute complicated signaling to a range of elite and mass public constituencies without over committing to any of them. More concretely, we saw little evidence that Putin has offered direct or sustained concessions to the Orthodox Church and the transnational anti-gender movement, at least not in his annual public speeches to a broad domestic audience. Over time, Putin has signaled less to liberal pro-gender equality constituents but rather than signaling a stronger commitment to the ultra conservative constituency, he instead embraced a Soviet stereotypical gender ideology that reflects the training and socialization of his generation of public officials and of much of the population. In the rare cases when Putin makes traditionalist or anti-gender ultra conservative statements, they tend to be in response to questions, um, not as material that he volunteers as a means to set a rhetorical or a political agenda. Uh, to be fair, I should also point out that in these speeches, he doesn't proactively declare himself to be against sexism or homophobia or to endorse you know, any type of family other than the nuclear heterosexual variety. Now, given the gender conservative policies of the regime over the past decade, Putin could use any or all of these speeches as a place from which to proclaim the virtues of a strictly gendered division of labor in the family. He could talk about the evils of abortion and divorce. He could talk about um, you know, the uh, evils of feminism, the merits of patriarchy, um, and so on. But he's repeatedly chosen not to do that. By contrast, even with regard to the policy issue that's most central to the regime's traditional values agenda, which is raising the birth rate, which Putin regularly mentions in these speeches, even when he's talking about that, he refrains from reinforcing an anti-gender ultra conservative perspective. And instead, he offers a range of remarks about child rearing and parenting that sometimes take a traditionalist tone but largely reflect a stereotypical Soviet view or even an egalitarian view. So our findings support the argument that Putin is what political scientist Tim Fry calls a weak strongman. Putin chooses his words deliberately to gain support from a variety of constituencies among Russia's elites and masses. His range of statements across the spectrum of gender equality categories speaks to the tactical nature of his public pronouncements 
Um, he signals his support to various elite constituencies that he depends upon to maintain his power. They include the Russian Orthodox Church and its powerful political activists on one side. They include more liberal economic and cultural elites, elites on the other. And the fact that the clear majority of his statements fall into the stereotypical Soviet category probably reflects his calculation that most Russian voters themselves fall closest to that model in their own gender views. So this analysis suggests that Putin mostly takes commonly accepted stereotypical Soviet positions on gender issues, periodically releases like trial balloons with his pro-equality and more traditionalist positions, waiting to come down on one side or another until it seems clear whether any particular position would be to his benefit. And this supports the existing scholarship on Russia's electoral authoritarian um, or hybrid regime, which lacks real political competition or free media, and in which it is difficult for the government to be sure of the preferences of key societal groups. When we look at his statements through a constituency signaling lens, it helps explain his move away from statements promoting gender equality over time in these speeches, as the constituency for conservatism has become more powerful. But it also explains his apparent reluctance to take ultra conservative or even traditionalist positions on gender issues. He's apparently choosing not to use these opportunities to further increase the power of this vocal minority of conservative constituents. Instead, he expands the less controversial stereotypical Soviet middle ground that most people find acceptable. Now, having said all of this, I just want to point out that while Putin may occasionally sound like a pro-feminist ally, um, we are not suggesting that there is little or no state-sponsored sexism or discrimination in Russia. Uh, women in Russia definitely face discrimination in the workplace, including widespread sexual harassment. Women face underrepresentation in politics at all levels. Women have extremely limited options for support from law enforcement in um, and the legal system in the event of domestic violence or sexual assault. Women have limited reproductive rights and an ongoing overload of family responsibilities. Feminist activists have faced direct repression ever since Pussy Riot was imprisoned in 2012, including prominent anti-domestic violence organizations being put on the foreign agent list and the arrest of uh, um, individual feminists for their activism over the past few years. Highly conservative anti-gender interest groups have way more policy influence than organizations and individuals that are concerned about women's rights. And although feminism is better known now than it was a generation ago, the backlash against feminism is also visible. So our argument is that Putin's messaging on questions of gender is strategic and complicated, and that Putin himself is not the primary public promoter of anti-feminist policy initiatives. Moreover, it's important to keep in mind that while Putin might be a proponent of traditional values in many respects, including a heterosexual model of households and relationships, his traditional values appear not to extend strongly to a belief that women should be subjugated to men. Our findings support the regime dynamics literature's argument that Putin is dependent on the support of multiple constituencies. We show that this is true even with regard to gender equality, an issue on which Putin has been thought to be quite conservative. In pointing out his reliance on constituents across the political spectrum, um, we hope we've shown the ongoing importance of gender to Russian politics and that it's possible that opportunities may emerge in the future for policy advocacy by feminist political leaders and movements to promote gender equality. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Valerie. This is uh, really fascinating stuff. Uh, I think it's very important what you uh, point out here uh, about Putin being a uh, a weak, strong leader, uh, and you you ended by saying that it's, his rhetoric is strategic and complicated and has to to uh, balance diverse elite interests. And I was wondering, when it comes to gender issues and, and, and policy, uh, taking into consideration this point about the, the, the balancing and the need to enlist support is this policy uh, reactive more than proactive? Is it more a reaction to 
ideological in entrepreneurs and interest groups than, than being set by uh, by the Kremlin? What is your take on that? I, th I think that's I think that's a good question. I mean, if we think back to what the actual policies are, right? Like, let's take you know, I think the you know the one that we didn't talk about LGBT. Um, we didn't we didn't look at well, we we looked and we decided that we couldn't really write about that in the same way because the coding categories would have to be so different. You know, the Soviet take on LGBT issues was criminal, like criminalized. So so we we sort of excised that. But of course, looking at policies, you know the um, homophobic policies, you know, also have to do with gender and are usually kind of combined in um, with uh, with policies relating to women. So uh, I would say, you know, so you don't get the nationwide homosexual propaganda ban until 2013. So you could, and it starts what I think in Rizan in 2006 with like a little local um, homosexual propaganda ban, and then there are a handful of others, and then St. Petersburg in 2012. I think that's a good example of the kind of, you know, there are some entrepreneurs there, right, sort of floating this up from below, and, you know, he gets to look around and see how does this go? Okay, it doesn't look like there's enormous popular objection to this, so yeah, let's do it. Let's have the nationwide and, and at that point, um, it's already after 2011, 2012, and the big popular protests where he's decided to, you know, make that conservative shift. So in that case, I would say there's some entrepreneurship um, and then approval and like a decision from the top to go ahead and make the call. With abortion, um, I also think that that was some entrepreneurship on the part of the Orthodox Church, because when you think about it, you know, Russia kind of went on and on. Well, the Soviet Union went on and on for decades, um, you know, after uh, after Stalin, um, with abortion being, you know, legal, accessible, all of that stuff. I think in the 19 uh, in the 1990s, there were some restrictions from the state budget about what would be covered. Um, I think that that you know, the, the Orthodox Church starts to have more influence um, in the 1990s, especially by the end of the decade where they passed that law on religions that says there's only really four truly Russian you know, religions. Um, and but I think you can see the growing influence of the church as the Putin period wears on. And so, you know, those uh, those laws limiting um, or uh, regulations limiting abortion you know, crop up in 2010 and 2011. So um, I, I think what it isn't, it, it's not the response to a big grassroots movement to outlaw abortion or to restrict abortion. I think it's tactical, you know, it's a sort of tactical decision from above to placate, you know, the church um, and keep its uh, and keep its support. Now, obviously, like Putin isn't about placating the church all the time. Um, if he was, he wouldn't have gotten divorced. Right. He, you know, um, he could have put leave me in a monastery or something, and, you know, the old school. Um, but um, but yeah, so I think so I think the answer to your to your question is that most of those kinds of more conservative um, gender policy tweaks are um, more or less from, um, you know, from political entrepreneurs who are doing what you do in that system, which is you go to the executive, you go to the you go to the president or to the general secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, and you try to get things um, you try to get things done through the executive branch. I think that it's less um, it's less about any kind of like big grassroots um, upsurge and less maybe about Putin's own idea. Like, I don't know that he's particularly um, I don't know that he's particularly concerned about uh, you know, abortion, or that he's particularly concerned about um, you know some of these other some of these other gender issues. I think he's taking his tips from from elites. I think Helga is frozen. Uh, I'm sorry, Valerie. I think Kelly is having some uh, issues with this uh, connection. Uh, 
Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I hope it's not me. <laughs> no, it's not you. <laughs> uh, we are working on it. Maybe uh, would you like to uh, see the, um, the questions that sure. that is published in the Q&A? Maybe you would like to. Um, so I'm just, uh, I'm not sure. Let me see. I'll look at the published questions. Um, so we've got the welcome poster questions. Is Putin trying to avoid the subject to avoid losing popularity and causing protests from the female side of the population? So avoid the subject of, um, I think, you know, it, what I would say to that, I, I was just responding to the first of the questions, Helga, welcome back. I think you got, you got frozen. Um, but the question was, is he trying to avoid the subject to avoid losing popularity and causing protests from the female side of the population? I mean, it's interesting, right? Think about what happened in Poland um, when, you know, when there were much harsher restrictions made on abortion, there were enormous protests, right? So I would say, yes, he's trying to, um, he's not eager to embrace a very conservative position, I think, um, especially on something like, you know, the the issue of abortion, um, because that could, you know, that could cause people coming into the streets and the, the least favorite thing I think of the Putin regime is when people come into the streets. OK, Helga, welcome back. Yes, I, I have some problems here, it seems. But but you addressed the first question now, right? Did I did. Yes. Yes. And in, in now I didn't hear your answers. I'm not, I'm not sure what, what you said, <laughs> but uh, I was wondering in, in when I saw that question uh, come in, if um, you could also go back to what Putin said in his speeches and is there a difference because the the, the March uh, 8 of March speeches mm -hmm. is primarily addressed to women so mm -hmm. so and, and you you mentioned they were slightly different but but uh, is he's he's saying does he have a different message there do you do you see more of, of uh, one of these stereotypes in in these addresses and uh, when he speaks specifically to women than these uh, general speeches uh, to, to the whole nation. Yeah, I mean, the main difference is that he says anything about women at all. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you know, it's, yeah, there, a lot of what he said that had anything to do with gender was at the March 8th um, speeches, and he was largely um, talking to women. I think what's most interesting there is um, when speaking directly to women, he was much more frequently saying something that was um, pro-gender equality, uh, especially at the beginning, you know, talking about how hard women work and how they're, you know, not paid as well relative to men, um, appreciating women for their professionalism and for their achievements, you know, initially, especially for the, you know, the first two terms. He's meeting with, um, you know, he's meeting with women who work outside the home, and that's what's being stressed. You know, he's meeting with particularly accomplished women. He met with, um, uh, with I think Russia's Paralympic uh, women's team. He met with, um, you know, high achievers in various, you know, various professions. And then it switches, right? And he's and he met. Um, uh, in whatever uh, year it was, and um, just the last, you know, in his most recent um, terms as, uh, as as president, I think it was 2015 or um, yeah, I think it was 2015. He meets with the mothers, right, of accomplished people. So that is um, reverting to a more traditionalist perspective, like not necessarily what he says, but in the choice uh, that he makes. And then what we didn't really talk about was after. Um, after that, he stops meeting with women altogether for the speeches, and it starts being a pre-recorded speech, like the New Year's speech, <laughs> where he like stands there and he says platitudes, you know, the usual things that get said on, you know, my, oh, women, you know, we love you so much, we couldn't do without you, you know, <laughs> you maintain, you know, it's it, so, so yeah, that's where you see the biggest, I think that's where you see the biggest shift. Mm -hmm. And then we have a question here from Regina Smith. Uh, thank you for a wonderful talk, Valerie. Uh, I'll second that, uh, but uh, I'll read it up here. Um, I wanted to ask about the strategy of using proxies to balance across these measures. The Russian Orthodox Church is clearly a clear proxy voice for the Kremlin. So are a handful of core conservative women legislators like Mizulina. 
But who or what other groups are projecting these messages? Are there proxies for the other streams of, of messaging? Oh, that's, such a, that's such a great question, Regina. I <laughs> um, loved your talk the other day <laughs> while, while we're at it. Um, so, so yeah, that's a really that's a really good question. I mean, there are other groups out there projecting, um, you know, say like the liberal, um, the sort of liberal feminist message. Uh, but right now they're being labeled as foreign agents. <laughs> you know? So I think that, you know, I think that that tells you something in terms of the, you know, in terms of the legislature, uh, in terms of the legislature, Oksana Pushkina is the person, is the Duma legislator. She's a former journalist who's been the biggest um, sort of out there pro-feminist ally, especially on domestic violence. So there's a group um, uh, led by Aliona Popova, who's a journalist and I think has gotten her law degree also. And she has an organization called, um, it's called W with an equal sign underneath it. So it's like about equality for um, for women, but she's really been uh, kind of uh, like a one woman show really hard at, well, not that's really not a fair thing to say because there are a lot of other activists that work on domestic violence issues. The Ana Center, which is a you know, nationwide network that's been working on domestic violence issues, you know, forever since, you know, the early to mid 1990s. Um, there's Nasil Yunyet, which is another you know, network that does domestic violence um, uh, prevention advocacy. They've been labeled as, as a foreign agent um, recently. Obviously, the Honest Center was labeled as a foreign agent a few years ago already. Um, so those are the sources, I guess, um, of protecting those messages, but they're not, um, you know, they're not coming from the, the Kremlin, you know, obviously. In, in terms of um, Pushkina, she's been, you know, as outspoken as you can be um, on the domestic violence issue, talking about the need for a law. Uh, and, and I know there was some signaling from Putin um, on the domestic violence law a few, a few years ago. Activists in that area were, you know, pretty convinced that they were making progress. Um, there was a Duma working group set up to try to develop this legislation and then uh, the pandemic. Uh, so, and I think the signaling that we've heard since then, um, and there was some signaling before the pandemic, like um, Maskalkova, I think that's her name, the, um, the ombudsperson for Russia, she had said something uh, that it was wrong to have uh, decriminalized that uh, uh, domestic battery, you know, so, so there was some signaling from the top and then there was the pandemic and I think Missoula sort of took the stage and said, um, you know, families are going to stick together during the pandemic. It's, you know, this is not going to be a problem for domestic violence, although of course it turned out that it was a big problem for domestic violence and the Anna Center actually increased their hotline hours to 24 seven because it was uh, because there was such an increase um, because of the pandemic. So I guess that's what I would say is there have been occasional signals from the top, um, you know, like the ombudsperson. Uh, and if you can consider a Duma deputy speaking up to be kind of a signal from the top, there's been some of that. Um, but, you know, but not much, I would say, coming out of the Kremlin it, itself. Mm -hmm. Good, and, and then we have a question or and a comment from uh, Olga Malinova, uh, who writes that she appreciates your effort to distinguish between the, the pre-written uh, uh, speeches and and uh, the messages from the direct line and uh, the press conferences um, and the spontaneous responses. Uh, and she writes, I, I, I think it's important to remember that speechwriters are in a sense an anonymous actor who make decisions concerning framing the president's speeches. Could you please tell us some more about the differences in representations of gender issues in the two kinds of speech? In I guess it says two kinds of speeches, but in speeches and in this impromptu responses or more yeah. scripted responses. Yeah, definitely, um, definitely. You know, for um, for me, so so the way that we split up the uh, the coding work. Um, uh, Alexandra Novitskaya dealt with the um, International Women's Day speeches and the New Year's Eve um, speeches. Uh, Janet Johnson dealt with the Federal Assembly 
Lisa McIntosh Sundstrom took the direct line and I took the big press conference. And I honestly think that, I mean, I think Alexandra had a good time uh, with the International Women's Day speeches because sometimes, you know, they're so over the top, but um, and it was different, you know, different constituencies and, you know, it was kind of uh, fun. And the trend lines were most visible there. But I think that, you know, Lisa and I had a, had a much more fun time um, than Janet did because, because the questions are really what drive the, you know, the interesting things that he says. And and period, and the thing is like when, yes, to some extent, the questions are curated at the direct line, even more so I think at the direct line um, than at the big press conference, you know, so there's some curation going on. There's some things he's not gonna have to confront. There's some things he's not gonna have to answer, but you don't quite always know at the big press conference what you're getting um, when you call on people. And so, so one time it was just a, in the recent, um, it was either in like 17, 18 or 19, I don't remember which year it was, um, but it was one of the pretty recent big press conferences. He called on a female journalist who had a sign that said family, you know, and Putin loves talking about the family. That's his favorite thing to talk about. So he calls on this journalist who has the sign family, but it turned out to be Farida Rustamova from the BBC who had a question not about the family, but about the family, meaning Putin's family. And it was a question about his daughters. And you could tell he was not at all, you know, he didn't know that that was her question and he was not at all happy to discover that was her question. And he didn't really, he, he wouldn't even acknowledge, right? She, her Part of her question was, when are you going to acknowledge that these two women are your you know, are your offspring. And he, you know, not only did he not acknowledge it, but he, you know, he was a little, you know, he was a little snarky um, in his response. So that kind of thing, you know, so that kind of thing is, uh, you know, is fun. Um, but that wasn't really so much, I guess, about a representation of gender. What, uh, you know, one of the things that we noticed was that the three, um, the three statements he made about that would fit into the ultra conservative category, those all came up at either the direct line or the big press conference. Um, one of them, like I said, was about juvenile justice. Um, he made a statement like unceremonious state interference in the family is unacceptable. And like that was part of the definition that we had made of what anti-conservative uh, and anti-gender ultra conservative means. So we, we put that in there. Um, we, we sort of check, check that off, um, but it wasn't about gender in particular. It wasn't like saying women need to get out of the workplace or, or something like that. But the other two, you know, which were on, um, which were uh, homophobic in nature, somebody asked him, do you agree that gay pride parades are satanic affairs? <laughs> and, and he said, um, you know, he didn't say yes or no to that. He said, you know, my opinion on, you know, the, on this issue, he said, is exclusively concerned with, with, it has to do with my position as head of the Russian state and the most important question facing Russia, which is demographic. Yeah, you know, so it was not, you know, it was not a particularly, you know, homophobic thing to say. And uh, and he added to that, um, well, I can't remember now whether he added to that statement or, or the next one, um, but he, he, um, he said, but I will always support, you know, people's freedom to, to basically do what they, you know, what they like. So it was, you know, it was sort of a nod um, uh, to the sort of, you know, anti-gender people or the arch conservative, I suppose, people on the one hand, um, not exactly, you know, appreciating the LGBT community, but also kind of recognizing this autonomous, you know, right to uh, to make your own choices. The other thing, the other question he was asked on this subject was about his trip to um, a European country. I think, uh, I, I can't remember which one. Um, where uh, the questioner said, you know, it seems like you spent from the news coverage, like you spent your whole time there talking about, you know, uh, gay rights and, you know, and they kept making you talk about that. And, you know, and what's the deal? And and Putin said, well, you know, just because they have a law there that's, you know, that promotes pedophilia, like why should we have to do that same thing? Right. So that was kind of a, you know, that, that was like a very clearly more, you know, uh, arch conservative thing to say. So that's, I think, the difference is that in, in that spontaneous setting, he sometimes, you know, gets to comment on stuff that he otherwise wouldn't. Like nobody wrote a comment about abortion into his federal assembly speech. Nobody wrote a comment about the legislation on domestic violence into his federal assembly speech, but he is given an opportunity 
to talk about it um, in the big press conference and direct line. I, I would make I would give you another example from the direct line on um, on domestic violence. When when he was asked that one question by that one journalist about it, she's you know she's a little nervous as she's asking, and she says you know when she's talking about how this law, which in which enables the state to you know be so involved in the family, this you know this domestic violence uh, law. She says um, it would be, it, you know, the expression, the expression, it would be the last nail in the coffin um, of our demography. She, she messed, she, she messed it up. Like she, she reversed. Um, I forget exactly how she said it, but she said it wrong, and he corrects her. And then she said, you know, something else about. Uh, he, he correct, he interrupted her basically several times in the course of her asking her question, uh, and and corrected her. So he was definitely not sending a signal. That like oh yes I'm totally on your side he was definitely giving her a hard time and that those are kind of like the fascinating things that are a little hard to capture you know in something the length of a journal article because if we retold that whole <laughs> the whole dialogue we would have you know we would have run out of space um, but yeah that's it's a it's a very it's a very good question and I'd be interested in you know what you said that that uh, the the verbal you know the the uh, spontaneous responses are different from uh, from the written responses. Yeah. Were there other questions? Uh, not yet. Uh, we have the first day of summer actually in 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 also after uh, extremely cold and wet May. So <laughs> so, uh, but I'm very happy to see that people are are still here. And uh, please post your question in the in the chat if if you have uh, more things that you want to to. Uh, I want us to discuss here, but uh, while we're waiting for that, uh, I'd I like to return to your. I see one more question. The, hey. the question is, why do you assume that Putin? Oh, sorry. Yep. <laughs> let's, let's go for the signaling first, then. Yeah, I think that's a very good question, right? Um, we assume that he's doing something. You know, the the political realm is all about the expression of power. Um, and, you know, even the general secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, right, has to do some signaling, right? I, I think that it's a, a probably a universal political phenomenon. In some political contexts, it's going to be more obvious than others, you know, um, it, where, you know, it may be in a more democratic state, the, you know, the president will say, will actually shout somebody out and say, like, this is my response to what I heard from such and such a constituency. Here, maybe it's a little more, um, here, maybe it's a little more subtle than that. But we assume he's, uh, we assume he's signaling because he bothers to get up um, and make all of these, uh, and make all of these speeches. Um, that, 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 that's my, that's my thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And while you were responding to that, we got a new question. Uh, we have been talking about women here, but we also should talk about men. Men and masculinity in Putin's discourse. Uh, mm -hmm. How does Putin's machismo affects in his uh, uh, overall portrayal of... No, how does Putin's machismo affect his overall portrayal of uh, gender equality? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so, Initially, when we were, you know, looking at these speeches, um, I was kind of most interested in that question, you know, of like, how is he signaling, um, you know, to what is he signaling about men, you know, and, and masculinity? And it's funny, like, I, I feel like we saw less of that in these speeches than I would have anticipated. Now, obviously, like, I think Putin is all about signaling about masculinity. I wrote a book about this, so, you know, so I agree. Um, uh, I, I certainly agree. I think that uh, I, I, sus I suspect that where his machismo comes out is on other topics. Now, we did not get into a fine-grained, detailed reading of all of these speeches, um, but I would think that it's on maybe other topics that he takes more of a, he makes more maybe explicitly um, um, what would you say, like aggressive statements, um, you know, maybe more insistent or, you know, or something like that on, on other topics, you know, on foreign policy issues. I think he's, you know, pretty direct. I guess what I would say is there's probably more toughness 
um, more signaling, if you will, of you know toughness, which is based in that kind of macho. You can't push Russia around. You know, I think I think there's a fair amount of that when he's talking about foreign policy. When he's talking about um, you know when he's when he's um, responding from a position of um, maybe being defensive, right? Maybe reacting. Uh, then I think you see more of um, more of that machismo coming out. The way that he discussed gender equality, you know, I didn't see, I didn't see too much of that. Um, I, I want to, I'll, I'll ask my co-authors that question though, because things might come to their mind that aren't that aren't coming to mind. We get some more questions coming in here now. Uh, um, what about uh, demography and the de demographic crisis? Uh, how does Putin frame this? Mm. Uh, is it only that women should serve the state and its needs and, 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 and give birth, or uh, is it as instrumental instrumentalist approach to women and childbearing? Oh, okay. Um, and, uh, yeah, it got, sorry. And here it, uh, the, the question is a bit, but we'll pick it up again. Um, if so, is that a somewhat instrumentalist approach to women and childbearing? That that would be in contrast to the traditionalists and the ultra traditionalists who would argue that having children is uh, indispensable to become a full in inverted comma uh, person, uh, realizing all, all her potentials. Um, is this in the chat? This or in the chat, yes. The chat, okay. It's at the very bottom. Okay. Or in the Q and A, maybe. Yes. Uh, so, uh, how does it frame the demographic crisis, the role of women, what they should do? I see it now. Okay, it's only they should serve the state and these. So, in, interesting. Um, uh, interesting. Yeah. So, it's it's not as instrumentalist as you might expect, right? Like, if <laughs> um, it's not as instrumentalist as you might expect. I mean, the certainly the thing he cares most about with regard to gender is the demographic question. You know, I, I don't think he's really deeply interested in questions of abortion or domestic violence or things like that. I think, you know, I think he does, he, he does see, um, you know, women and the production of more children in an, in an instrumentalist way. What I think he gets though, is that he's in Russia, you know, like this is a highly educated female population. This is a highly urbanized female population. Um, the trend in countries that have highly educated, highly female, uh, highly professionalized female occupations is not for the number of children per capita to go up, right? It's gonna go down. So, uh, so he has to take a sort of instrumentalist approach to women and childbearing in order to try to affect it in some um, in some way. Now, it, it's true, I think, what you say that maybe, you know, from a traditionalist or ultra conservative perspective, it's like um, it's woman's uh, duty to herself or to God or something like that. Um, you know, you can put those two things together, though, if the state also has an interest in increasing the birth rate. Um, and what's interesting is he doesn't use that rhetoric at all when he's talking about it. He, um, uh, you know, he, he takes a much more, um, it's, I'd say a more egalitarian or more stereotypical um, or Soviet uh, uh, approach saying like, yes, we, we do need women to have more children, but this should not keep them out of the workforce and we should facilitate, uh, we should make it more possible. And so this maternity capital program, I think was very much an instrumental approach. What the, what the program does is it gives women a certain amount of, um, of money for every child that they have past the first one, although they just, I think they just changed it to um, include first uh, first children. And the idea is that when the child turns three, <laughs> then you get the money. So if you if you don't do a good enough job or you, or you give the baby away uh, to, you know, for for whatever uh, reason, or if the child, I suppose even if the child doesn't survive for some, uh, you know, for some um, kind of terrible reason, I think you. I don't think you get the funds, but anyway, they 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 uh, they give the mother the funding when the child turns three, and it can only be used, you know, in limited ways. It can be used towards education, it can be used towards um, improving the housing um, of the family, or it can be used, I think, towards the woman's um, like pension. Uh, and um, 
And this is an instrumental approach designed to somehow convince women to have more children. Now, I think some people have analyzed it as being um, traditionalist because, um, you know, because uh, it, it seems to be saying that like this is like women's responsibility and it's something that women should, you know, it's something that women should do. The way that we coded it was we called it traditionalist uh, when the policy was linked to the prescriptive idea that women should have more children, but when it was just descriptive, when it was just talking about the demographic problem, um, then we called it uh, stereotypical slash, uh, slash Soviet. Um, especially if he was talking about you need the maternity capital in order to get women back into the workforce. Um, you know, in that case, it's very it's very Soviet sounding. It's like the job of the state is to, you know, women should have children. Of course they should. But then, you know, we have to get them back into the uh, into the workforce. And Putin does not say he really does not attach a firm should in any of these speeches to the idea that women should have children. As I said in my talk, the closest he gets is somebody says, I have three children. And he goes, Maladets. Like there's an implied should like you did the right thing <laughs> there's an implied normative uh normative thing there so yeah good good um good good question and sticking to children and you mentioned putin's family and him getting a question about his family during uh, one of the uh, press conferences one of our uh, uh viewers asked about putin's family and uh, the rumors about him having two kids outside of, of marriage. Um, and Putin denying this, obviously. Uh, and the question is if he's trying to hide this because it would um, not fit in with the picture of the traditional view of the Russian family. Family, yeah, you do hear those rumors every now and again. It's Alina Kabayeva or it's, you know, somebody else. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it would be for that reason. I think he is just an enormously private person. Um, you know, he's divorced. He could have gotten remarried. There, you know, there was an exchange at one of the federal assembly speeches where um, where I think he referred to, um, I think he re relayed a conversation he had had maybe with Berlusconi or with Schroeder, with one, one of his foreign uh, head of state friends who had asked him like, how is your love life? You know, this is after the divorce. Um, and he said, everything is, you know, and Putin said, you know, everything is fine in that regard. And his interlocutor was like, do you love someone? And, and does someone love you back? And he said, yes. So um, that's about as, that's about as much as you're going to get in 20 years, you know, <laughs> like one, uh, one statement. So I think that if he has other children with um, women who are not his wife, I think he would be highly unlikely to uh, to talk about it, not just because it's not OK at the traditional view of the Russian family, but because he's Putin and, you know, he wouldn't even, you know, acknowledge his daughters are totally grown um, and have professional lives. Uh, he wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't acknowledge he wouldn't acknowledge that. Um, yeah. And then um, the question I was going to to uh, to start on when when you found another yes. uh, question in the chat um, and that that was something you hinted to when you you made your presentation about uh, the challenges challenges related to coding uh, and you said you could come back to the to the some of the questions that mm -hmm. you would face in coding uh, you, you mentioned this specifically when when we're talking about the maternity uh, capital but but if you could say uh, a little more about uh, Sort of the te technical aspects of the, of your research here. Yeah. So um, so the coding uh, the coding was interesting. So we we hired a Russian native Russian language uh, graduate student um, to do the initial coding, not the ideological part. But you know, first we came up with these um, gender related terms like women and you know woman and man and maternity and you know family and kind of everything that we could think of having anything conceivably to do with gender and we did that both sort of inductively and deductively like we you know first thought off the top of our heads and we looked also in the um in the feminist political science literature uh and we also looked through the speeches to, just to see what kinds of words you know are, are being used what kinds of words are you know are, are um, used by putin in these speeches um, and so first we had the graduate student go through and and just 
identify it, code all of those terms. Um, now, one interesting thing that happened <laughs> was that those terms got coded even in the questioners um, questions, so like the journalists or the callers questions. So it took us a while to figure that out, and then we we're like, uh oh, we can't count any of that. So then he had to go back through and create nodes within in vivo that were for people other than Putin, like speakers other than Putin. Um, and that was one of, you know, that's one of the ways where you see that he doesn't necessarily respond in the same vein to, you know, a Russian Orthodox uh, journalist um, or a journalist from a Russian Orthodox newspaper. He doesn't necessarily respond in the same terms as what they feed uh, to him. Uh, so first we did that and then we went through um, and did some coding together uh, using the gender ideological category. So what, how would we call this? What would we call that? You know, what do we think of this? Um, and and we would and then we just sort of gave you know we we went and um, coded them as I said before like I did the big press conference um, once and I would go through and as I went through all right that looks pretty you know gender equality all right that looks pretty stereotypical whenever we had any questions about it we put in an annotation and we would meet every few weeks um, and uh, and with one of the other um, you know one of the other coders and share our questions like, all right, what would you how would you handle this? And we discuss it. And if and if we still couldn't resolve, we bring it back to the group. <laughs> so we were pretty we have pretty good intercoder, you know, reliability, if that's the right um, if that's the right word for that kind of thing. Um, now we had to, you know, we we made some decisions. So, for example, with the maternity capital, um, as I said, we only called it traditionalist if it was accompanied by some sort of should. And those were pretty, those were pretty uh, subtle um, or, or weak. Um, most of the time it was stereotypical uh, Soviet, but sometimes Putin would refer to the maternity capital program by its actual name um, in the actual policy, which was maternity, open parenthesis, family, close parenthesis, capital. So we referred, when, uh, whenever he called it the maternity family capital, or on the rare occasion where he called it the family capital, then we called it neutral um, because that's an instance where it would normally be gendered, um, you know, female, like so mothers, you know, maternity and women. And instead he was abstracting it out more to the family um, and talking about it, you know, in that uh, in that way. So yeah, so that was some of the, <laughs> those are some of the, you know, fun with, fun with coding. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, no, it was it was interesting. And then uh, to go through and, you know, actually do the, you know, the, the counting, you know, the counting up, you know, that was really interesting afterwards because we waited till more or less till we were done to really see how it how it looked like we had our impressions about how it looked. The other thing I can say is that we didn't just code the the hits like on those search terms. We coded the phrase um, uh, and if he was talking about you know whatever whatever he was talking about if he was speaking if it was all um like for a whole paragraph and things came up over and over like he's talking about maternity capital so not only would he say maternity capital he would also say family child children family like he would you know use a number of those words if he's going along in the same vein and answering the same question or speaking about the same thing we would just code that whole thing, that whole paragraph, a stereotypical Soviet, for example. Um, but sometimes he would switch, right? And um, even in a sentence, if he starts the sentence, you know, with stereotypical Soviet, but ends it traditionalist, we would code both of those things. And we created another category called um, contradictory, uh, meaning that within the space of a sentence or two, he was using two different gender ideologies. Most often those gender ideologies were neighboring, you know, so it'd be like neutral and um, stereotypical Soviet or stereotypical Soviet and traditionalist. Occasionally, though, you know, they would they would skip a category. <laughs> You'd have like a little gender equality followed by, you know, the sort of stereotypical. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess we should wrap up, but uh, I think this has been uh, very interesting and I look very much forward to, to, to reading uh, your research when it's published. Uh, do you have any immediate plans for, for publishing this? Uh? Uh, we have submitted it to a journal. 
Um, sure. I don't know if you're supposed to say like <laughs> things to journal, so I won't. Um, but uh, but yeah, we we just submitted it like a, yeah. a week ago. So um, so great. Look forward to reading that. Uh, yeah. I would like to, to thank you very much for uh, for uh, your presentation. I'd like to thank the audience for for joining us here for this event, and also like to to use the opportunity just to say that we will be back with more Legitrus uh, seminars in the fall, uh, when we will hear from uh, two of the other members of the Legitrus team, uh, Gulnas Sharafutinova from King's College and Andrei Makarichev from. Uh, Tartu University. So stay tuned for new updates from the Legatrus uh, project. And uh, in the meantime, have a great summer. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>